This is Dave, and I'm here with Ethan, and together we are Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, episode 213-inch. On this episode, we have more with the award-winning director and co-writer of Weird the Al Yankovic Story, Erica Pell, in part two of our interview. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. It's a podcast about Weird Al. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. Seriously, the whole podcast is about Weird Al. You don't have to listen, but we're glad you are. Happy final Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al podcast, inch of November 2023. You don't know that. Yes, I do. There's only one more day of November. So, there's still no guarantee. I think the odds are pretty good that we will not be dropping a brand new full inch tomorrow. Yeah, you're totally right, but you never know. No, actually, I do know. It's right here in my contract. Oh, by the way, Ethan, in that photo you sent me of you on stage with William Shatner the other week, were those new pants that you were wearing? Dave, let me answer your question with another question. Would you be caught dead on stage with William Shatner while not wearing new pants? Um, maybe. I rest my case. All right, well, I suppose it's time for What's Happening in Weird Al Related News. This past weekend, Weird Al made his Broadway debut in Gutenberg the Musical. Well, Dave, we are no experts when it comes to Broadway, but our friend Jeremy Ween, co-producer of Gutenberg the Musical, is. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe he can tell us what's going on. Hey, Jeremy, are you there? Hey, hi, Ethan. Hi, Dave. Hello. I don't know if there's anyone more qualified to tell us what happened than you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm, as you both know, a big fan of the podcast and also Weird Al, so it's great to uh, be joining y'all this evening. Jeremy, what was your role with Gutenberg the Musical? So I am a co-producer on the show. Part of my responsibilities are I helped raise money so the show could be produced on Broadway. I also help with some of the marketing and promotional opportunities for the show. And I also somewhat have a small hand in booking the performer cameos of which Weird Al was our cameo performer over the weekend in the show. I will be clear, though, I did not book him. I wish I had the power <laughs> to, but I was not personally responsible for booking him. Well, so Gutenberg the Musical, it stars Josh Gad and Andrew Rannells. Can you tell us about the show itself? So the show is about two guys, Bud and Doug, and they are the ultimate dreamers. They have uh, written this musical about Johann Gutenberg, and they have decided to do essentially a backers presentation with the hope that a Broadway producer is going to give them their contract so they could go to Broadway. And you soon learn that they may not know as much about Johann Gutenberg as anyone knows, because <laughs> there actually isn't really a lot known about Johann Gutenberg. That's the point that he was born in a certain year and he invented the printing press. It sounds absolutely hilarious. Is now. How exactly did Weird Al get involved? We have an opportunity within the show to plug people in to do a cameo, but we have been really fortunate to have a lot of wonderful people from not just the theater world, but also the comedy world. You know, recently we had Will Ferrell, we had Steve Martin and Martin Short together. Wow. And we had Lin-Manuel Miranda do this pretty early on. And from what I understand is that Lin did it. And then of course, Lin and Al are good pals. And I believe essentially it was like, Al was like, well, I want to do that. <laughs> And so we did see a video pop up on Instagram, but can you give us a little bit of context about this character that Al's playing? So Al is playing the, quote, Broadway producer. Some people are just doing it very straightforward according to the instructions, but there's other people who are really trying to kind of make it their own moment. And, you know, as you can see in the video, Al is very much enjoying every second <laughs> of what's happening it very much felt like Al's Broadway producer persona got very handsy with Josh. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's also great because you in the video, you can hear the audience just 
I mean, the audience really responds to it. And I think it's just a great moment within a show that's already so heightened and exciting and funny to then not really have any clue who might pop up <laughs> at the end. Towards the end is, you know, really exciting. Jeremy, in your totally unbiased opinion, how was Weird Al's performance in his Broadway debut? I think it was great. It was totally his energy. I thought it was very fun. And I'm glad we kind of got the like zany Al as opposed to the deadpan Al, <laughs> if that makes sense. Because he very much could have done it the deadpan, well, I'm a Broadway producer shtick. But I'm glad it was very much felt it in his body all over the place, high energy kind of way that he played it. I thought it was very fun. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for popping in and giving us the insider's knowledge of what went on and what we could have expected if we were there. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to let people know if they're interested in buying tickets, they can visit GutenbergBroadway.com. That's G-U-T-E-N-B-E-R-G-B-Way.com. And yeah, you can come see a Broadway show for only $49, which I mean... Josh and Andrew are worth at least one and a half times that amount. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the opportunity. It was really wonderful to get to talk to you guys and be on the podcast. Thanks for joining us, Jeremy. Last Wednesday, Multimorphic released a brand new software package for their pinball game, Weird Al's Museum of Natural Hilarity. This latest version of the software contains gameplay enhancements to Germs, Mission Statement, Amish Paradise, and You Make Me Game Modes, among other quality of life changes and bug fixes. Highlights include increased visual distinction to the angry Almebas during germs and a brand new multiball for a mission statement. Weird Al Pinball owners can download the latest version on Multimorphic.com or through their Pinball Machine's system manager. Sadie Beans Ice Cream in Ottawa, Canada decided to celebrate Weird Al Yankovic with a special flavor last week. The flavor featured blackberry lavender ice cream with dulce de leche and toasted almonds. So obviously they named it A Million Times as Humble as Thou Art. Mmm, tasty. But maybe it would have been easier just to make Rocky Road. This episode is brought to you in part by Vegan Burrito Restaurant Burrito Burrito, home of the two-pound double wrapped in quesadilla burrito burrito and Wizard Burger in Albany, New York. Come on down to Burrito Burrito and Burrito Burrito, your Burrito Burrito and Wizard Burger for mouth-watering loaded, dare I say, beefy vegan burgers from Albany to Uranus. Burrito Burrito and Wizard Burger feed the hungry with out-of-this-world plant-based real food, always vegan style. Visit burritosquared.com and wizardburger.com to order ahead. All right, now let's check out what's happening in Dave and Ethan's 2000 It's Weird Al podcast related news. Over the Thursday weekend holiday, Albuquerque, a Weird Al musical by William King was posted on our YouTube page, youtube.2000inch.com. Big thank you to William King for writing the script, organizing and recording on Zoom, and editing it all together. And... Huge thanks to all of our friends and listeners who play the various characters. An audio-only version of the performance is also available to download over at patreon.com slash 2000inch, if you'd prefer not to see everyone. On the last episode, we aired part one of our interview with Weird the Al Yankovic story director Eric Appel. Let's pick up the interview where we left off last episode, already in progress. I want to go back a little bit in the writing process. How different was the final script from that initial 15 page outline you wrote? And also when it came to, you know, you guys doing the evens or the odds, was there anything where it was like, well, we need to switch because this one is definitely a scene Al should write, or this is something Eric should definitely write. Um, no, I mean, well, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, you know, we ended up, um, you end up rewriting each other so much and we both had like such a plan for what we wanted. So if I got, if I happen to get a chunk, you know, like um, if I got the Escobar scene, yeah, right. I think I had part. So I think the Escobar scene, maybe Al, Al had like half of it or something. Maybe I had the other half. Hmm. I know that like Al, I'm pretty sure that like the majority of the Escobar dialogue and all that stuff in that first half of the scene is Al. Okay. And then I think a majority of the second half of the scene was me of like Madonna, you know, the, the, the turn at the end, yeah. at the end yeah. of it after Escobar gets yeah. killed. And, and, um, I think so. I think I might've, and then I think my, yeah. Cause I think I wrote the, um, when he's walking through the jungle 
I think I wrote the first version of that, like the Illuminati holiday party, <laughs> like all that stuff. But, um, so I think like, yeah, I wrote like the second half, but I know that he wrote all the, I don't know. You end up, re- like I said, right, you end up right. rewriting each other so often yeah. that, or so, so much that you, you don't really know what what is whose, you know? So nothing was, was sacred in that, like, you know, like, oh, the, the scene about, you know, Weird Al picking up the accordion for the first time, that has to be Al writing it. It was just, you guys had such a, a an outline in place that it really didn't matter who wrote what. Yeah, like we knew even in, in the outline that like the music, you know, uh, the music swells and, you know, he's, uh, we like it was written, even in the outline that he's like staring at the, he's getting transfixed by the baloney and he's like <laughs> coming up with the word. Like that was all in, in the outline, like Al and I just laughing together you know, writing that in paragraph form before any of us went off to script. Right. Um, what was the, I'm sorry, I forgot the first question. Like, <laughs> so, yeah. So the, the first part was just how different did the final product, uh, was it from the outline or were you true to that outline? Um, I mean, there were, there were a lot of things that were very true to the outline. Um, you know, the, all of like the big moments were really true to the outline. There's jokes and stuff. That's right. The, that's what like each of us really added the most of. Like the outline has some jokes in it, but the outline is mostly just like story and, you know, what does everyone need to say to move the story forward? And um, what are the emotional beats that we have to hit? And what are the things that we have to set up that we're paying off later? And, character arcs and you know here's what people's motivation is in certain scenes and so yeah like it it it, you know it really stuck to what the outline was there there are some things that did end up shifting like and we got notes once we um once tango entertainment came on and um you know they had a few notes on the script uh that we took into consideration just to not like this isn't funny you get rid of it but just ideas to like strengthen certain things and this relationship needs a little bit more nutrition and Hmm. you know it might be stronger if uh you know lean into this a little bit more they kind of just like guided us a a, a little bit as far as that goes just and really it was like mostly in the second half and the third act just you know it's going to be very rewarding for the audience if you know this happens or Right. That's a lot. That's something we did in editing too. Just um, I, we were very aware of uh, uh, not like undercutting the emotion. That's a lot of the stuff that we cut out, which we, you'll see on the deleted scenes. It was like ends of scenes where something big and emotional happened um, that we had filmed a joke that happens immediately after that like (laughs) undercuts it and it was really like throughout the whole i think like almost every scene has like one of these (laughs) moments and then you get the you know i got into editing and i'm like i had to call al and say like hey man so like when you see the cut you know there's good there's some stuff that like is not gonna be in there and you're gonna go why is that not in there and like trust me it's um you know what when uh when Toby Huss smashes the accordion and fights with with teenage Al and Al storms out and he says, good riddance, you want to end that scene just looking at Toby Huss's face as he's like, <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of regret behind his eyes. And then you need like that transitional shot of the ocean where the audience has a moment to just kind of think, right? Think about their own dad. Think about a fight that they've had. Like, they have to live in that moment. But, like, we shot a joke immediately. <laughs> like, we shot a joke where they, where, you know, mom, uh, uh, mom comes in and she's like, what? what happened out here? Where's, what is going on? Where's Alfie? And he's like, he's dead. (laughs) And she goes, what? And he goes, no, to me, he's dead to me. (laughs) And she goes, oh, she's like relieved. And it's such a, I mean, it was like a really funny joke, (laughs) but it just like killed, you know, right. It's, yeah, it's really interesting. And that was like the, uh, really a learning experience for me. Um, 
just uh you know putting it all together and coming to these conclusions of like oh wow yeah i thought it was going to work the one way the way we wrote it and it just doesn't you know that that's not what this moment needs <laughs> it's the movie <laughs> movies are just really about like the flow so much of it it's just like it has to have this kind of organic flow and if it's wall to wall jokes um I don't know, maybe it starts getting boring after a while or you you don't have enough to grab onto if you don't get to sit there and think every so often. So was Hey Boy in the original outline or did that come up in the writing process and whose idea was Hey Boy? All right, Hey Boy. <laughs> <laughs> hey Boy was my uh Hey Boy was my idea. Hey Boy was in the original outline. <laughs> and Hey Boy is something that um we both like laughed at it so hard when I pitched it um, <laughs> that I got immediately paranoid that I had stolen it from something. <laughs> and I was like, I'm like, oh no. I'm like, did I take Hey Boy from something? Like, it feels familiar to me. And I think it's just because, like, putting a thing in your bed. Uh, you know, putting pillows in your bed or a dummy in your bed. Like Ferris Bueller puts a dummy in his bed, right? Um, so, like, that's a thing. That's a trope, putting a thing in your bed. Okay, making him... Uh, and, and I think my thought process when, when coming up with it was like, all right, this is kind of old-timey, you know? This is not Ferris Bueller. It's not the 80s. So, like, like I, I don't know. For some reason, I was thinking, like, young Al... His parents, their uh, the quaint home they live in, Clark Kent. Like, what would Clark Kent do? Like, I guess that like Clark Kent lives on a farm, and like young Clark would put a put like a scarecrow in his bed, maybe. So like, and then my brain just went to hey hey boy, like call it a hey boy. That's a stupid funny name, and. Um, and then and like we we laughed at that and then like what if everyone has hey boys like what if hey boys are a thing that people in this universe know about and uh, cuz i always lo i love that when something exists in a movie and it doesn't exist in our world but it's like a pop culture it's a fake pop culture thing <laughs> that only exists in this movie and it's like yeah everybody knows what hey boys are come on duh <laughs> Um, but I got like really paranoid about it and, and I looked it up like I was, I would like every so often I would Google like, Hey boy, scarecrow boy, <laughs> Hey boy in comedy, you know, like, and I could never find anything. I'm like, all right, I guess I did make it up <laughs> when we were shooting the movie actors would, would say, Oh, I read that. I love the script. That Hey Boy thing's really funny. And I'd go, have you heard that anywhere? And they go, what? I go, nothing. I'm sorry. I just thought, like, I'm afraid I didn't make it up. I'm afraid that I stole it. <laughs> and they, they go, no, nah, I've never heard of it. I mean, I'm asking ever like, I'm asking Tom Lennon. You right. Know? I'm like, you guys didn't do it on the state, did you? Like, <laughs> I'm, like, working with all these, like, comedy heroes. I'm right. Like, it's not from your thing, is it? Whatever. Al would mess with me too, like that he saw Hey Boy somewhere. He's like, oh, I saw a thing with Hey Boy in it. I'm like, no, did you? He's like, I'm just... <laughs> it was in the Bible, apparently. That's that's what it was. And they didn't call it a Hey Boy, but it was like a boy. It was a child made of hay or something. I can't remember like what Bible, what, what chapter that's in in the Bible. But we did end up like figuring it out at one point. Wow. And I'm like, I don't read, I didn't read the Bible. It's not, that is definitely not where I got it from. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now, I want to pat ourselves on the back because as soon as Daniel Radcliffe was announced as Al, there was all sorts of pandemonium in the fan community. How could he be a good Al? I think very immediately Dave and I saw the vision that you and Al had for Daniel, and obviously he worked out to be the absolute best choice. What was the process of casting, and what were some of the names you guys were throwing around before you settled on Daniel? Well, I'll tell you, like, for, uh, for the original trailer, and I don't know if I taught, I said this last time I, I was on, other names that we threw out for that one. We, we were chasing, like, we were trying to get Tom Cruise right, and Sean right. Penn. <laughs> Tom Cruise, Sean Penn. Um, uh, gosh, 
who Ed, Edward Norton. That was one <laughs> that we were throwing around back for the original one. And then, uh, and then obviously Aaron Paul and Aaron Paul was, was amazing. Um, that, uh, when we, when we went to make this new one, you know, the reason that someone like Radcliffe works so well, it, it's the same reason that Aaron Paul worked well is that he's nothing like hell. Right. <laughs> you know? And if the whole joke of this thing is it's in, it's like an alternate universe, weird Al Yankovic. That's, um, you know, where the in, invention of, uh, making up new words to a song that already exists is like the invention of rock and roll. Um, and I think we do, we, we never, by the way, I, sorry to digress, but we never, we never say that the parodies are funny. Do we in the movie? <laughs> like, I, I don't was think thinking so, about that. The other day. No, no, I don't think so. I don't even think that they're like, no one's ever like that song's so funny. <laughs> it's like that's true that that right. is not addressed i don't think it's not addressed it's not addressed like i think the joke is that it's like innovative it's not funny it's just like unheard of making up new words right to a song that already exists that's why yeah. that's why when he goes it, yeah when michael jackson parodies him it's not like well is it even funny Right. It's, is it, you know, is it even about food? <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, uh, so what, what was the question again? <laughs> I digress and then I totally lose my, uh, lose my train of thought. My ADHD is just like firing on all cylinders right now. <laughs> yeah, the question, I, I guess, is, you know, who were some other people that you would have considered oh, right, uh, right, right. when you were thinking about who could play Al? Yeah, so... Um, I mean, Radcliffe, we came up with Radcliffe's name. Radcliffe was on like a list of other names that we came up with. And then we had to figure out how to like rank that list. It's a really, it's a stressful thing. <laughs> casting, <laughs> casting movies is really crazy and stressful. And, uh, you know, I know that like amongst the names we were throwing around, Radcliffe was one. J like, I think Jake Gyllenhaal was a name we were throwing around at one hmm. point. Um uh, Adam Driver, Timothy Chalamet, like the people that you'd expect. Okay, you know, so not um, you're, you're not looking at comedy actors. You're looking at serious actors who right. Could pull That's off the thing. Comedy. We were, yeah, we were never looking at comedy actors. It was always like who's who are dramatic actors that are that have done funny things or that we think have a good sense of humor or like hosted SNL and did okay. like um you know like. Chalamet is funny. I think that Wonka movie is going to be great, actually. I know a lot of people are down on it. <laughs> you know what? I'm saying it right now. I don't know if this comes out before or after the Wonka movie comes out, but I think Wonka is going to be great. I'm saying it here. I'm calling it. Wow. Wonka is going to be great. All right. It's the same director that did the Paddington movies, and those are great. Um, but like Adam Driver did SNL. He's, you know, he did the, that Kylo Ren thing. It's like he's right. funny. He's funny on girls. He's just. You know, he's funny. Right. Jill and Hall, obviously, yeah. r very funny. Um, and But Radcliffe is the first one that we, like, went out to, um, which is amazing that it was just like, yes, <laughs> immediately. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of doesn't happen. How do you go out to Radcliffe? Is it you have to go through his manager, his agent, this whole process? Or is it is he someone that you sort of had connections to to sort of float it? Yeah, well, no, we didn't have any connections to him. Um, I, like, I know the Daniels a little bit, so I, you know, maybe could have somehow got to him through them. But we, we went through Funny or Die. Uh, Mike Farah at Funny or Die talked to Daniels' um, agent, Sue, and, you know, sent over the idea. And Al wrote a little uh, cover letter to send with the script. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. He sent a little cover letter and it was about how, um, you know, he had seen like how we think he's that uh, Dan would be great for this and how Al had seen him um, do the elements song on Graham Norton uh, with with Rihanna. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just he knew like from that moment, he knows that Radcliffe's a guy that gets it, you know, <laughs> I mean, that video is a turning point from, you know, I, not that it, my relationship with <laughs> an actor on TV makes, makes really any difference, but I, I liked him from Harry Potter. And as soon as I saw that though, 
I, I probably had a similar reaction to to Al. I was like, wow, this guy's actually really cool. He's not just some, you know, dumb actor. He's he's actually really cool, and I want to hang out with this guy. As soon as I yeah, saw that, yeah. you know? Yeah, for, for me, it was, um, he was on Extras. He did, like, a little, on that Ricky Gervais show. Um, he did a little bit where he played himself, and he was, he was still doing the Potter movies at the time. Um the scene was that like Ricky Gervais and, and, or maybe the female character that was on it with him. I can't remember her name are, are extras on a movie that Daniel Radcliffe is in. And he's like very rude and very (laughs) sexual when they're talking to him. And I was just like, he was playing himself. He was playing it very real, but he was just being like a disgusting misogynist. (laughs) I think, I think that that's what it was. But I remember seeing that and I'm and and being like, oh wow, Dan Radcliffe rules. This guy, this kid is great. And um and then obviously uh, Swiss Army Man and um, uh, Guns Akimbo and like you know some of these movies that he was in and him on Miracle Workers. I thought he was really funny. Yeah. So you know it made sense uh, for us. the The world knows him as. Harry Potter as a dramatic actor, as the lead of a movie franchise, you've experienced the wizarding world through the eyes of this person. (laughs) And I thought that it would just, you know, there's no one more perfect to like introduce you to a world than someone that has proven they could do that. (laughs) You know, he's got such a compelling face and, and, (laughs) Um, you know, the audience knows him so well, you've been with him on all these other movies and, uh, you know, there's, there's, I don't know. There's something about his eyes. That's the thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he does, and it's in, the, in in our movie too. There's like that scene, you know, when he reconnects with uh, with his dad at the factory. It's such an insane scene. A guy just got killed by this <laughs> machine, and then like he's having this moment with his dad. You can see there's tears in his eyes, and you're just like really drawn in by it. it it's. It, it's really amazing. Um, you know, there's a reason why like the most famous actors in the world are the most famous actors in the world. Right, like right. not everyone can do that. Even with the most training, right. like he's just got it, you know? Do you think that the film would have been greenlit without Daniel's involvement? Like even thinking of uh, Adam Driver, or the other folks that you mentioned, I don't know that they have that worldwide name recognition that he does that really, I think elevated the film to this, you know, must create movie, you know, having him involved. Yeah. It's funny. Like I, I think that, um, you know, I, I always try to try to, you know, dissect why people passed on the movie. What was it about it that made people pass? And, um, Part of it is, you know, so many movies, foreign foreign sales and, and how things are going to play overseas are really taken into consideration. And comedy already notoriously doesn't play that well overseas. It doesn't translate. Right. Um, and I think Al's comedy in particular, you know, when we were showing, we, we screened the movie in Mexico City because uh, Roku is, is in Mexico City. And... Um, there was like a little after party after they invited a bunch of like influencers and stuff, young kids who maybe are like a a little too young, even in America, you know, unless you have parents that are like turned you on to Al, um, that, that were like, the audience was like a little too young and they, and they did some of them I was talking to didn't know who Al was. And then, then I started thinking about it. Wait a second. Like Al's comedy is rhyming it's lyrics it's lyrics that are english but like what makes those so songs so funny is that they you know it's words that rhyme with the words from the real song but it's all in english like i don't know how that translates if you're not if you don't speak english (laughs) you know um it's not like a comedy movie where you could just put subtitles up Sure, you could put subtitles on a song, but but it, yeah, it just really loses something. If I heard a parody song that was in like Japanese, I would be like, "I okay, that's funny. All right, I have no idea what this person is saying." So, um, so I I think that that's definitely um one of the bonuses of having Daniel Radcliffe in your movie is that he can bring it to a global audience. So talking to those kids in Mexico City did not know who Weird Al was, but loved the movie. And they they loved Daniel Radcliffe because they're big Harry Potter fans. Right. And they said, 
It was so good, but they and they loved the movie. They said because it felt like Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> all right, sure. Because I guess just like straight biopics that aren't about comedians that get lost in translation, uh, you know, maybe have a little bit more. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so since we're on the casting theme, I want to ask you a little bit about casting the grotto and uh, how that came to be. <laughs> oh man, that was so fun to uh, that was so fun to cast. <laughs> I mean, it was fun for it was so it was so like easy to cast because it was all at, like it was just Al asking people. Um, he basically, <laughs> um, you know, sent me a list of. Like from from the moment we uh, wrote the outline, we knew that this was going to be like our big cameo filled scene, right. and that's something that like Funny or Die typically is like so great at getting getting lots of cameos and getting yeah. people to come out for stuff. And um, you know, uh, we wanted like all of our comedy friends to be playing these you know old classic uh, uh, comedians from you know the seventies and eighties and just comedians and weirdos and, um, <laughs> like who would be at this party in this fake this fake Doctor Demento universe where he's right. just like the the king of like weird comedic counterculture <laughs> like. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, basically Al sent me a list of like everyone that, um, you know, people that are on his, his Christmas card mailing list, basically like here's people that I can reach out to personally, either via text or email. Right. Uh, and, and you know, who, who do you think would be good? Um, I will tell you this, Jack Black wasn't even on that initial list. Really? Um, yeah, because it wasn't Wolfman Jack at first. Who was it? Oh, uh, that scene was written uh and from from the outline up until up until the movie got greenlit that was supposed to be freddie mercury at that part interesting okay <laughs> um and we had joked that we wanted to get rami malik to play freddie mercury cuz you know he played him in. um so uh and even, I mean, I'm sure he would have never done it, but, but the, yeah, the whole joke was like, Al's at the, you know, uh, Al's at this party and, and Pee Wee Herman and all these people are there and he's like the new kid in town. And, uh, and then Freddie Mercury is like, oh, look at this guy, you know, uh, <laughs> you, this guy thinks he's so great. You know, can you make up a parody of my song? Like we got a hit heating up the charts right now. Uh, you think you could do it on the spot, you know? And he's like, oh, I don't want to. Oh, come on, man. We're at a party. And he's like, is this your king? He turns around. That's what he says. To everyone. It was like really, really silly. Like It's like gladiator all of a sudden. Um, and uh, anyway, and then, and, then he play, and then he played the song. And, and uh, yeah, I can't even I can't remember what the maybe it was that Freddie Mercury invites him to do a duet with him. And he, we, we did the hard pass at the end of that, too. Um <laughs> And then what ended up happening was uh, Queens uh, or the Freddie Mercury estate. So like in, in order to, to play Another One Rides the Bus, we had to get the you know publishing rights or whatever to Another One Bites the Dust because we're using the melody in the movie. So, you know, Queen is going to get royalties from that. Right. And you don't just have to pay to, to use it. You also have to tell them how you're using it. They can say, no, we don't want you to use it. And, and um, they told us that we could use the melody of the song under the condition that we did not have Freddie Mercury in the movie or hmm. mention him or even mention him oh. by name. Interesting. Like, Interesting. Okay. So we rewrote the scene to just be the three other guys from Queen. <laughs> <laughs> and the joke and and the joke was that no one at the party knows who they are without <laughs> Freddie Mercury with them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can see how this thing evolves like of that because a piece yeah. of that joke ends right. up in the final product. So, um, so what happened then was uh, we wanted we're like okay, we got to get a good trio to play the Queen guys. What if we get uh, the Lonely Island? So we reached out to the Lonely Island, and they were like, "Oh yeah, we we'd uh, we'd love to do this," but Andy Samberg couldn't do it because his wife was um, due to have a baby like oh, the week geez. that we were shooting. Hmm. 
So then Al was like, all right, here's some other names that maybe we can get for the third guy. And Jack Black was on that list. <laughs> and I said, I don't know if I want to have like Yorma and Akiva and Jack together because, you know, then it's going to start feeling like, um, you know, I haven't, I I've still have never seen Dewey Cox and I don't, I don't think I ever, ever will now. Controversial <laughs> opinion, out there. but you don't yeah, need to. I, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> but but I did watch on YouTube. I I've watched the clip of uh, when the Beatles are there, and Jack Black is one of the Beatles, and I'm like, I don't want this to turn into like people doing silly accents. And um, uh-huh. I go, what if we, you know? So I pitched Al, what if we have it? Uh, what if what if Jack plays Wolfman Jack? What if we get Jack Black to play Wolfman Jack? And that kind of makes sense because Dr. Demento is a radio guy and right. so is Wolfman. Right. And, and they do different yeah. types of things and they could be rivals. And it's like, <laughs> oh, this is your new protege, you know? And like, really, like Wolfman Jack is just trying to make Demento look bad. Like, he, you know, he, he doesn't care about Al. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and anyway... Oh, and I also said, I'm like, and if Jack doesn't want to do it, maybe we could get Tony Shalhoub to be Casey Kasem. <laughs> that was my other thing. <laughs> and Al was like, I really love these jokes about the Queen guys. And uh, and then, so we ended up, I'm like, let me just write a version of the Wolfman Jack scene. So I wrote that and I sent it to him. This was when we were in pre-production. Um and then he's like, all right, I made some adjustments. So he sent it back to me and he put the queen guys in the Wolfman Jack scene. Okay. And I was like, all right, well, it just feel, it feels kind of long. So then I tweaked it again and we ended up landing on one guy from queen <laughs> and Wolfman Jack. And like, and yeah, I was having a problem with like, well, how do we organically come up with like, yeah, it's nice to have a guy from queen there because he's the one that suggests another one bites the dust. Right. Um, and it just so, sort of works perfectly because he's just yeah. another one bites the dust is a very fitting thing because he thinks that he, Al's going to bite the dust. <laughs> um, anyway, that's how we land, landed on that. Uh, so then after that happened, I guess the, the rest of the scene wasn't really cast. That was like when we were st- still going through casting. Um, uh, Nina West as Divine, that came to us uh, through... F- through casting and, mm-hmm. and funny or die. Um, there's a line that was cut out. You'll, which you'll see in the, in the deleted scenes. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad we got to put that back in. It was just a little too long and it was, uh, I don't want to give any other spoilers about it away, okay. but it, it just made the scene, it just messed up the flow of the scene. Um, we knew that, uh, Al wanted emo to be in there, uh, as, as Dolly. Um, and, uh, and then we're like, all right, well, let's make Yorma Pee Wee Herman. There was a moment where we were like going to have Paul Rubens play Andy Warhol. Oh, we discussed wow. that. Oh, wow. But I got nervous. We both got a little nervous that, um, you know, Paul was like very protective over Pee Wee. And, uh, and I just like, I was, I was, I wanted to have the Pee Wee Herman moment in the movie so bad. I was afraid Paul Rubens. You didn't want him to cut it. Yeah, I thought Paul was going to be like, can you guys, like, I love it, and I'll come play Andy Warhol, but could you not have Pee Wee in the movie? Uh Uh-huh. That was my big fear. So, like, we didn't reach out to him. In retrospect, I wish that we did reach out to him. (laughs) It's, like, a real bummer. Um, Because, of course, he passed away this past year. And had he seen the scene and and commented on it? He had seen it. And he posted about it on uh, on Instagram, uh, which was nice. Um. And uh, yeah, and Yorma said that he he reached out to him about it. Uh, but yeah, and then so like we had Yorma as Pee Wee, and then Akiva reached out to Al, and he was like, "Oh man, I heard that you made Yorma Pee Wee in the movie, and like I wanted to do the Queen guys. I want to be in the movie. Can I do something?" <laughs> and he's like, "I'll. I don't. He's like, I don't even have to have any lines of dialogue. In fact, I would prefer if I didn't have any lines." <laughs> and we're like, "All right, let's like make him Alice Cooper because we had in the script that there was like a bunch of other random. We're yeah. gonna have background actors, um, you know, dressed up as people. So we're like, all right, we'll we'll put him in. You know, I'll give him like good placement when we block the scene. Um, 
Gallagher. There was Cheech and Chong we were going to have in there at one point. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> but we ended up swapping Cheech and Chong for Gallagher. Um, and, uh, and yeah, but like everyone in that scene, it was all, it was all, those were all like people that Al um, could reach out to per- personally. And it was amazing how quickly the responses came back. Like, he asked Jack Black, and Jack just like texted him back immediately, like, "Yep, I'll do it." <laughs> like what? Awesome. Like Al's like, "You're never gonna believe this." Conan O'Brien just was like, "Yes." What time do I have to be there? I'm like, "What?" Um, and Conan, we got him in and out really quick. He showed up, and we like shot his scene with uh, his little piece with emo first, and then we shot him just like by himself <laughs> applauding. And he was not there during the performance. Everybody else was. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, we just kind of inserted him. I uh, had the opportunity to meet Brett McKenzie of Flight of the Concords, and he mentioned that he was offered a cameo, and he wasn't able to make it back from New Zealand. Are there other people who just really wanted to be in it, like him and, and Andy Samberg, who just, the timing just didn't work out? Oh, um, yeah, like Adam Pally, I asked at one point, we wanted to do it, but it didn't work out. Nick Kroll, uh, it didn't work out because of timing. He was doing History of the World for Hulu. Mm-hmm. Um, he had said yes, and then had to had to uh, had to pull out. Oh. Um, I can't remember who else. I can't rem- I can't remember who who Brett was supposed to be, either. I know that we had asked. I know there were like some people that we asked, and they were they were like we would love to, but no. I remember Mark Hamill. We asked. Oh to, wow! To do something. <laughs> oh wow! And he like yeah he he. he he wanted to, but he he was like out of town or shooting oh, something man. else. Oh, that would have been great. Um, <laughs> I know. I was like, I want Luke Skywalker and Harry Potter in a scene together. As, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I can't I can't think of anyone else that was like, you know, gonna do it and then and then couldn't. Yeah. Now, while we're on the the subject of cameos, there's some lesser talked about, dare I say, non-celebrity cameos in there. You know, Al's wife, Suzanne, your wife and daughters, your brother, Brad, Allie Gertz, the two greatest Weird Al podcasters of all time. Are there other... (laughs) uh, Are there other folks who showed up in the film that are not necessarily like Michael McKeon or Jack Black that that we don't know about? Um, Yeah, let's see. Uh, Oh, there's the... um... Skunk barf guys. <laughs> well, right. I mean, I guess they're all. Yeah, Johnny Pemberton uh, is the front man of Skunk Barf. He uh, shares this office with me that I'm in right now. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> and he was also, yeah, the star of uh, the titular star on Son of Zorn, which I which I directed. Yeah. Um, Jonah Ray uh, is is in that band as the drummer. Jonah um, was the writer's assistant on the Andy Milanakis show season two. Um, when uh, that's where I met him in 2004, and when I first visited Los Angeles, I slept on Jonah's couch for a week. So, uh, so I paid it forward. Are Jonah and Johnny? Are they going to be offended that you're listing them as non-celebrity cameos? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they're not Michael McKeon and Jack Black. Oh. Okay, I was, <laughs> yeah, but... I, I love. I mean, maybe they will be someday. They're, they're a little more but... than you know, <laughs> Dave and I though. <laughs> they... <laughs> they're not better than my wife and daughters. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so, all right, so, like, uncredited, uh, uncredited cameos. Um, uh, and, I, well, since I mentioned the other Skunk Barf guys, Jeremy Bohm, the other guy in Skunk Barf, mm-hmm. uh, is the guitarist of this band called uh, Touche Amore, who um, who I actually, his, uh, his, his wife or girlfriend, uh, Ashley, I can't remember if it's his wife or girlfriend, but... Um, I used to work with her, and then I was on his podcast. That's how he got the invite. I knew he was in this band. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I did his podcast, and I knew he was like the front man of this band, and he looked pretty hardcore, so I'm like, all right, <laughs> you got to be in this band. Um, yeah, okay, so my my, my wife and daughters, uh, yeah, they are uh, when when uh, Dan does the split after, the, after uh, putting his letter in the mailbox. Uh, my (laughs) wife and daughters are there applauding. Um, obviously, yeah, you guys are in the, uh, oh, here's something funny. The, uh, (laughs) I mean, this isn't someone that I, I, uh, I invited, but 
they just happened to be there. I a long time ago I directed this uh, commercial for Heineken <laughs> with a with an Abraham Lincoln. It was like a fake movie trailer <laughs> for this sci fi movie where Abe Lincoln gets cloned and the and the and the Abe Lincoln guy who by the way is like the premier Abe Lincoln impersonator. Like if anyone casts an Abe Lincoln in anything, it's always this guy. And he was one of the Amish. He was like one of the Amish paradise guys. And I like saw him uh, in, in like extras holding. I was like, Hey man, I did that link clone thing for Heineken. You remember that? He's like, Oh yeah. Wow. Like, cool. You're one of the Amish guys. Um, yeah. Let's see. So, uh, Oh, Oh, okay. So I, have a cameo of course um two cameos uh, well uh, two cameos um i am i am the voice of uh um captain buffoon on the radio <laughs> captain buffoon on your radio dial Love it. <laughs> and uh i am also uh, the guy in the control room during the uh award show at the end um and next to me is newman that's my uh she she is uh was my first ad and uh, the guy that's and Zach, our line producer, is standing next to me. Zach Haley. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So, uh, so the yeah, those two uh, snuck in there. Um, uh, Alice, um, she was uh, Daniel Radcliffe's assistant um, during the production. She is Cindy Lauper next to Doctor Demento oh. in the audience. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah so we we got her all made up um and yeah as you said as you said before um al's wife suzanne is uh is playing uh tony scotty's date <laughs> and uh and Allie gertz is is uh is behind them she wrote to me on uh she sent me like a direct message on twitter and she was just like hey this is so awkward to ask but like can i do, like do background in your movie and i was like yeah sure i'm like of course you can yeah like what do you want to do here's a, here's like a few of the days all people got to do is that you know you want to do background ask me <laughs> Pretty approachable. i'm just kidding don't please don't ask me i don't want to uh, i don't want to have to put my messages on private You're right uh, <laughs> Well, well, Eric, I guess, you know, Dave and I have obviously talked about, you know, our side of the story of how we became extras. What was it from your point of view? I would love to hear your version of Dave and Ethan being invited to be in Weird, the Al Yankovic story. Um, well, you know, I had, uh, when when working on this movie with Al, I, I famously said in some interviews, I did absolutely no research <laughs> to write the Weird Al bi- <laughs> biopic, right? Um <laughs> But uh, but I did listen to a lot of your podcast. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I did. Uh, yeah, I, I like became a fan of the podcast like uh, during, you know, my uh, during like the two or so years that we were like developing this movie. And um, and so, yeah, when you when you guys reached out about uh, being I can't remember exactly how it went down. You asked me. Kind of the same question that Ali did, did, right? Like, pretty much. Can I come out? Like, yeah. Um, would it yeah. be possible? And I was like, yeah, of course. Um, and uh, and I was like, I have the perfect scene for <laughs> that you guys. I think would be like great in. You'd fit right in. You know, you both. You're you're both a couple of tough, a couple of street toughs. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, you, so you guys uh, uh, flew out for the biker scene, and uh, and I I was like I'm gonna put you guys I'm like make sure these two are right in the front of the audience. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you came all the way out, you flew all the way out, um, and uh, I'm like I got it, I got to put you guys on camera as much as I can. Um, and then I remember that like we that I ate lunch with you guys. Yeah. yeah. And um and you knew an incredible amount about the movie. <laughs> then I was like, how do you know this? Like I remember at one point you were like, so uh I'm like, what else do you know? Give it to me. You're like, I heard so and so is playing so and so. And I was like, no, that's not true. They're not, but like we did go out to them and they almost did play that character. Um I'm like, how did you know that? I don't want to know, but I love that you know. I love it. Like, I, there's something about that. Um, 
you know, like, oh, we got scooped. Like, we're important. Like, people are talking about, people are, like, trading info about, like, what's going on on the set of our movie and who's getting cast. Like, that just makes me feel like, or what are we all, what are we, like, a Marvel movie all of a sudden now? Uh, I mean, to Dave and I, it's, you guys are a Marvel us, movie. Are. Yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it, it, that's funny, too. Like, the paparazzi um there were some paparazzi photos that leaked when we yeah. were on set and I couldn't believe it. I was like so mad at the time um, because the photo that leaked, the first photo that leaked was Daniel in his, um, in like the camouflage Hawaiian shirt. Yep. And, uh, and that was like a joke, like that shirt being a camo shirt is just a joke. You know, it's like, Oh, he's in this military scene. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's out in the jungle. He's wearing Hawaiian print camo. Um, and, uh, and those pictures, you know, he's like drinking like a Starbucks coffee or whatever, wearing that. And he looks all strung out and I'm like, Oh no, people are going to know that our movie is crazy. It's not just like a normal, (laughs) we're not just doing a straight and narrow biopic. He looks like a strung out crazy person in a camo shirt, but, uh, but no one really put it together, but it made me feel so cool that, you know, Oh man, there's paparazzi photos leaking. People are talking about the movie. There's buzz. It, yeah, that was. I mean, Dave and I had a, a lot yeah. of fun tracking down, you know, us weeklies and stuff wherever there was a a paparazzi photo or anything about the movie. We we tried to track those down. Yeah, we really got nailed on the uh, on the day when Jack Black and Conan and everyone were there. There was yeah. like a full. There was like pictures of every single cameo, and thankfully, like there had been enough leaks at that point, because like when the, like the first images of Daniel as Weird Al blew up, like yeah, that those were everywhere. Um, so by the time it was like I think the third leak was when all those other people, uh, it didn't get quite the pickup that you know the first one did, right? Yeah, so. That was that was exciting. So, but did, uh, so did you? You guys had fun though. You guys had fun shooting. I tried to make it a good time for you guys. With all of the stuff oh. that I had going on, it was also <laughs> important to make it a good time for you guys. <laughs> 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 so, I, that, well, everyone watch, that watches the movie to know that, like, I am directing my little buns off making this movie, and I'm also <laughs> trying really hard to make sure that David and Ethan are having a pleasant experience. <laughs> <laughs> being in the movie. Oh, you know, it, it's so funny that you bring that up, Eric, because cause that is what one of the things that I tell people when they ask me about what I, you know, remember from that day is I'm like, here's this director, you know, he's uh, he's got a million things on his mind and he comes over and he sits down with us at lunch and he spends, I don't know, 20 minutes with us talking about us and making us feel like we are the stars of the movie. Like, and it, <laughs> It's just like one of those memories that just I have and that that I just I really want. I don't know if there's a question in here, but I really want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you for listening to the podcast. And hopefully you're still a fan of the podcast. Oh, yeah. No, of course. I still, of course, I still love it. <laughs> yeah. As soon as that, as soon as I cash my checks, I'm out, man. <laughs> no, it, it really was just, it was a spectacular experience. I mean, we, we could have had no. In, in niceness from you we could have had no you know featured background actor status and we still would have had an incredible time and it just they were just cherries on top oh, for, for such sure. an incredible experience for us i mean we got home from that experience and recorded like hours and hours and hours just every single second that we remembered from it and those episodes that came out uh, we released them a year after filming so earlier this year uh, a lot yeah. of our listeners say like they loved hearing that and they loved hearing about the behind the scenes of what actually happened and and they they felt like they were there because we were able to share that. So it it not only was it awesome for us to get to do and it it was, you know, a dream come true, it also, you know, was a gateway for a lot of other major Weird Al fans to really get to have that experience too. Oh, that's great. I love, uh, I love hearing that. You know, it's, uh, that I'm just thinking about that day again too. Like that was a really crazy day. It was a, that was a third day of filming. Yeah. And rain Wilson, uh, that was his first day and he had just been cast. Um, he had just been cast like on Friday and he came in for like a beard fitting. I'd spoken to him over the weekend on the phone, (laughs) But it was like, 
first thing up that it was such a big day and I had so much I had to get. And, uh, and we started that day off with like rain and Daniel and they're meeting for the very first time in real life and in the movie. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) That's actually, that's really funny. I didn't even, I didn't even really think of that until right now that those guys were meeting for the very first time in the scene where they're meeting for the very first time. Wow. That's cool. Um, Oh, wow. Yeah. They didn't even have a set. Like they, like rain literally said, you know, Hey, nice to meet you. Uh, (laughs) All right, let's rehearse. (laughs) We have finally have to start shooting in 15 minutes. So we're not going to make the day. Um, the other crazy thing, you guys were there all the way to the end of the day when we had the crane in in there and we we're shooting the performance shots. That was so much fun. Oh yeah, yeah. That was a, it was stressful because I was like, is someone going to get hit with this crane? We're in a really <laughs> cramped place, this big heavy piece of machinery swinging around. Um, but I don't know if you uh, uh, remember this, remember me talking about this, or if I even talked about it after we <laughs> wrapped that night because I know I said bye to you guys outside. Um, but like, I didn't get all of the shots that I wanted to get. Um, I didn't get any close ups of Daniel performing. Um, cause we ran out of time. Like we went into a little bit of overtime that day. It was one of maybe two days we went into overtime mm. and, uh, and I got, I did f- maybe five takes of the full performance and the camera was like moving around and I was kind of calling out, um, to the camera operator who to go to and when, and, and, the final take we did, we, we, you know, put the camera on things that it had never been on. Like it was on the drums a little bit and it was on the guitars. Um, so there was enough to like put the scene together, but I didn't have any close ups, and I was so nervous about it. And I asked our, uh, I asked my editor, uh, Jamie Kennedy, I was like, can you, um, cut this scene together like as soon as possible and just let me know if it works without close-ups because I wasn't able to get close-ups. And she did it, and she sent it to me, and I watched it. And she was like, I think it works okay. And I was like, I don't. I don't think it works. <laughs> you need these close-ups. <laughs> you need the close-ups. Um, yeah. So it was our um, second to last day of shooting with Daniel. And we were at the Yankovic house, and we were shooting all of the stuff with him reuniting with his parents. Um, and the next day we were to shave his mustache off and his final shots in the movie were the close-ups of the Amish paradise performance. Oh my gosh. I didn't even think about how you guys had to do that. (laughs) So yes. So we, so Daniel grew a real mustache for the movie. Um, and when we, and we filmed the Amish Paradise performance and the awards show in the middle of the schedule. Um, and my my craziest week of shooting. I shot on a Tuesday. I shot the pool party on a Wednesday. I shot um, the <laughs> concert where Al's drunk. And <laughs> then on Thursday, I shot the whole awards show and performance. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> it was like a really, really crazy week. That would have been like three full weeks if this was a Marvel movie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway uh we had to shoot the amish paradise performance on stage but we could not shave dan's mustache off because we had a lot more movie to film so cat bardot our makeup department head um made a fake flap of skin to cover daniel's mustache um like had to make like a prosthetic that he wore over his upper lip and mustache. Uh, so, and, and we, but we couldn't shoot close ups cause it looked super disturbing. <laughs> I, I, I will say that like when this movie comes out on 4k, uh, I mean, it's on iTunes now if you want to, and it's 4k, I believe there, if you want to pause it on those scenes, take a nice close look at Daniel's face in those wide shots performing Amish paradise. And, it looks like he's got like a puppet mouth. It just like he it's like very disturbing looking. Or it looks like a it's it's bird like. It's very beakish. I, I don't know how to explain it, but it's <laughs> Is that what we see him peel off when he leaves after the performance? Yes, yes. That's what he peels off. So 
Yeah, so he has skin over his mustache. As one would wear a fake mustache over their skin, he wears <laughs> fake skin over a real mustache. Wow. And I was like, and that was like a last minute decision. I said, okay, oh, this will be a funny, we'll get a joke out of it. He'll peel the skin off when he goes back, <laughs> revealing the, that the mustache is still there. Um, so, uh, yeah, so he goes uh, So he goes back and he, he peels that off. Anyway, uh, so the, our last day of shooting, we had to get the, we had to actually shave his mustache and shoot the real close-ups where, where uh, it didn't look weird. Um, or it did look weird. It, did, it, did, it looked norm, normal, whatever. Uh, right. So, um, boy, the thing with this movie, saying the word weird right, is so right. hard. Al and I talk about this all the time. Uh, okay, so, uh, so the night before, we have, we're maybe like an hour and a half away from rapping and i said listen let's get through this scene as quick as possible can we rap can we have like 20 minutes to spare at the end of the day and is there is there any way that we could shoot the close-ups of daniel performing at the cobra pit um can we do that here tonight we are in the living room of the Yankovic house. Okay. <laughs> like the rock club has like a sparkly, uh, um, a sparkly like yellow curtain in the background. Yeah. And so we're like, okay, me, me and, and, uh, you know, our gaffer and, and Ross, our, our DP, we're like, okay, let's figure out how we're going to do this. Uh, we are shooting in the kitchen. So we're like, let's broom all the furniture out of the living room. We'll we'll shut the curtains that we had put big curtains up because actually the back of that house it was a door that led to the backyard but we wanted it to just be all curtained hmm. so we had these like beige curtains that went all across there we brought in these four parkan lights we put yellow uh, gels on them we hung them up in front of the curtain we blasted the curtain with yellow light we shot lights at the camera we basically recreated. <laughs> the stage from that bar <laughs> in like 30 minutes. Oh, and then wow. we shot three takes of Daniel walking out, tapping the microphone, like, uh, Hey, I hope you guys are ready for this. Like, wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. and, uh, and, uh, we, yeah, we shot three takes of the performance and like, we use the hell out of them in the movie. Like they're all like those shots totally made it in. And they like, without those, that scene, um, you guys would have been great, but the scene would have suffered. <laughs> you guys still would have been fantastic. <laughs> but Daniel would have suffered. People would have been like, I like these two guys in the front, but this Radcliffe kid, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but those close-ups, yeah, like totally saved us. And uh, and then we sent them in, and they got cut in, and, and, and Jamie was like, okay, wow, you were right. Those really do make the scene so much better. <laughs> That's incredible. I mean, without... Knowing that, I don't think anyone would ever suspect that. I mean, it just, it's seamless. Yeah. Yeah, I got another uh, crazy, pr stressful, pr there were so many stressful moments. I look back with such rose-colored glasses because all I can think about is like the reception <laughs> right. that the movie got right. and like, uh, right. you know, I, just how happy I am with it and and that that whole experience. I sort of block out like the the really crazy frustrating experiences, which one was the Pablo Escobar day. We need to stop the interview again, right there. But don't you worry, we will be back next episode with the exciting conclusion to our interview with Eric Appel, including Eric's official answer to what they make at the factory. And in the meantime, if you're not yet following Eric on Instagram, check him out at E-R-O-C-K-A-P-P-E-L to see what projects he's working on and which video games he's currently playing. This episode is brought to you in part by Discover Darwin, promoting tourism in Darwin, Minnesota. Not only is historic Darwin, Minnesota a beautiful, it's also not mentioned in Explore Minnesota magazine. I just visited Minnesota the other week, and while I wasn't able to discover Darwin, I did take a look at the yearly Minnesota travel guide. As one does when visiting Minnesota, of course. I read that magazine cover to cover, yet even on the maps, I didn't see a single mention of Darwin. Oh, the horror, the travesty. 
How are people supposed to discover Darwin if it's not even listed in the official tourism magazine? And get this, Dave. The things that were listed in the magazine totally sucked. Oh, no way. What sort of stuff? Well, for one, Dassel was mentioned. Gasp. I mean, <gasps> Dassel of all places was mentioned? Hopefully something bad, though, right? Like, you know, how much Dassel sucks. It mentioned the Pigeon Lake Important Bird Area in Dassel. The Pigeon Lake Important Bird Area? Yes, the P-L-I-B-A. What the crap is that? It's a place that presents ideal conditions for nesting water birds such as egrets, herons, comorants, and pelicans. You know what? That actually sounds kind of nice. Nice? Nice? Well, I think we should make it our mission for Explore Minnesota Magazine to egret ever mentioning Dassel instead of Darwin in the first place. So visit Darwin, Minnesota on your next egretful expedition. Discover Darwin more than just the twine ball. And after you visit Darwin, Minnesota, be sure to attempt to visit discoverdarwin.biz. Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast is brought to you absolutely free. Thanks to our incredible sponsors, Brio Brito, Wizard Burger, our very own Jackson Scoggins, and Discover Darwin. Our podcast is also supported by everyone else in our Patreon family, with special thanks to our amazing close personal friend level Patreon supporters. Scotto, Javier, Kev, Ron, Matt, Zeb, Zach, Blair, Ajax, Gus and Alicia, Adriana, Jake, UH Jeff, Kenneth, Allison, Dana B, Casey, and thanks to Maria and everyone else in our pretty stinking majestic Patreon family. If you enjoy our family-friendly Weird Al podcast, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash 2000inch. There are really awesome benefits like getting your name on the podcast, your very own private RSS feed, which gives you early access to each and every single bonus episode, and the self-satisfaction of doing something important with your otherwise pitiful, meaningless existence. And now would be a good time to join if you haven't already, because you'll be the very first to hear our final few remaining brand new ridiculously self-indulgent bonus episodes the instant that they drop. And don't forget to check out our official merchandise over at shop.2000inch.com. All proceeds from purchases go directly towards supporting our fine podcast. We love hearing from our listeners and other Weird Al fans, so be sure to join our Facebook community over at group.2000inch.com and visit our Discord server for even more riveting Weird Al and Red Rump the Goody related conversations. You can find both of them linked on our website, as well as information about past episodes and guests over at 2000inch.com or weirdalpodcast.com. Keep up on new episodes, podcast news, and events by following at 2000inch on Facebook, X, and Instagram. And be sure to subscribe everywhere you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. Not only does subscribing help the podcast, it'll give you the ability to see John Cena. Plus, we also love it when we receive voicemail via our official patent-pending 27-hour-day podcast hotline 347 Spatula, as seen in the 2023 Ringo Award-winning graphic novel The Illustrated Al, The Songs of Weird Al Yankovic. That number is 347-772-8852. Give it a call or a text, and you might even hear your message in a future episode. Thank you once again to our guest, Erica Pell, and Gutenberg the Musical co-producer, Jeremy Ween, for joining us this episode. Thank you to our very own UH Jeff, William King, George No Last Name, and Claire Walsh. Thank you to the Grammy Award-winning Jim Kimo West for our incredible podcast theme song, and thank you to the 17-time Grammy-nominated Weird Al Yankovic, as this podcast probably would not exist without him. And a big thank you to all of you, our loyal listeners, subscribers, Patreon supporters and sponsors, and everyone else who makes our podcast possible. Thank you for choosing Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. And until next time, remember to gill and chill, keep listening to Weird Al, and stay cheesy. Dave, did you see that WWE is selling official Raw Celebration used confetti? Wow, no way, really? Yeah, it's from Seth freaking Rollins' inaugural World Championship and comes in a tall display case. <laughs> well, believe it or not, I actually have confetti from a wrestling event. But is it in a tall freaking display case? No, actually it's not. But I bet wrestling fans would buy it regardless. They'll 
buy anything wrestling related. Totally. What freaks are losers? Oh, uh, Dave, by the way, I just got an email that our 20 volume sets of the Encyclopedia International that only mentioned Weird Al in one sentence just shipped. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm so glad that we each ordered two sets. Only two? I ordered six. That was Dave Nathan's 2008 Weird Al Podcast, episode 213 inch. Jeez, now I need to get one of those producer hats. With all of the stuff that I had going on, it was also <laughs> important to make it a good time for you guys. I am directing my little buns off making this movie, and I'm also trying really hard to make sure that Dave and Ethan are having a pleasant experience. <laughs>